So I want us to start with a question, which actually is the same question as, oops, as this. And then I want to think about this question. So I'm going to tell the story of three products that come from tech. Each one is considered pretty successful, and each in its own way is touted as a good example of how to build technology products that promote sustainability. And then we'll return to this question to, to go through and think about how these products succeed or not in promoting sustainability to help us like help us create a new framework to, to think about this question. And since this is a tech conference, um, one of the ways we can think of this is moving through the stack that powers our work. But instead of thinking about servers and programming languages, we're moving through the socioeconomic, cultural, and regulatory Reg regulatory stack that lets us do our work. So the first case study, um, the iPad. While I was doing the research for this talk, I video chatted with a friend in London because she was doing research on systemic oppression that I really needed help with. And my ability to have this conversation with her in real time, despite the fact that I'm here in Washington, DC and she's in London, is a unqualified good. The things that we as technologists make produce real good in the world. That is hugely important to keep in mind. Um, products like the iPad have let people connect in amazing ways, and that really is what we're trying to do here. But the iPad, and for that matter, the computer you're using right now, um, do you know where it comes from? can you account for the source of all of its parts? Because if any of the gold or zinc comes from Bolivia, it probably used child labor. If it came from the Congo, it probably used child labor and funded wars. If the neodymium magnets in, the mag in your hard drives and our electric cars were processed in Mongolia, they probably contributed to this, which is a giant lake that is entirely the toxic byproducts of refining rare earth metals. And this lake is only a few miles away from farmland and a city of 2.5 million people. And by the way, the mines that power this lake hold about 70% of the world's reserves in rare earth metals. So when I say if, I really meant this is where technology comes from. And that's a huge problem. So that was the beginning of the life cycle of our electronics. Um, for those of us in um, for those of us in the U.S., if we're being responsible citizens, re we recycle our electronics, and they end up at a recycling center, which is good. Except recycling centers, which we kind of have to remember, are landfills by another name. Um, in the US at least, are predominantly in communities of color and poor communities, which means it includes all the health risks of living near, near a landfill. So recycling, which we rightfully should consider um, one of the best tools for of environmental responsibility, has become yet another tool of oppression. And this isn't just the problem of class or welfare. Um, if we look into statistics, black Americans who make 50 to $60,000 uh, a year are more likely to live in polluted neighborhoods, such as neighborhoods near recycling centers, than white Americans making only $10,000 a year. And because this happens to minority communities that have less political clout, Legislators and regulators often just straight up ignore them. So what's a, what ends up happening is from the beginning of the supply chain to the end of the supply chain, the ugly side of our technology, the stuff that we spend so much time building to make good in the world, is shipped out of rich communities and into communities of color and the developed world. Sorry, this is depressing. 
So I want to come back to this question. Why is user experience about how easily our users are able to buy the products we're selling, but not about the broader and so social and environmental impact of our products? How do we think about what we make from cradle to cradle? And how do we think about the entire production chain, not just from manufacturing to our consumers, but from the beginning of the, the very beginning of the supply chain, not just to the end of life, but to the start of the next life and the life of the product, the next life of the product and the next life and the next life and the next life. So into the second one. Tesla is doing amazing, wonderful things. They're simultaneously somehow making electric, electric car status symbols for the wealthy, which means they buy them, and bringing the price of electric cars down for the rest of us. And they're doing it while they're releasing all their patents uh, open source for, the, for other companies to use because they honestly believe that all of us need to migrate away from fossil fuel cars as quickly as possible. And this is wonderfully fantastic. Wonderfully fantastic. Except, If a fully recyclable car that is entirely powered by renewable uh, energy, wait, sorry, is a fully recyclable car that is entirely powered by, sustain, by renewable energy sustainable if the materials used to build it were mined with forced labor? Is it sustainable if it contributes to that, to that giant toxic lake in Mongolia? Is it sustainable if the only people who can afford it are the rich? And by the way, when I say rich, um, if you make more than $10,000 a year US, which is about 8,900 euros, you're above the world median income, which means we're the rich people. When it comes down to it, the majority of people will never be able to afford a car. And even if they could, the environmental and social impact of producing that many cars would destroy entire ecosystems. The six lane freeways, the suburbs with McMansions and massive lawns, the suburbs where residents don't know each other because all they do is drive from their, from, from their garage to the parking lots in front of every store. That world is unsustainable. The electric car, is fundamentally a technology solution to a problem that only exists because the system itself is broken. Producing less polluting cars will not fix environmental problems. Producing better transportation systems will. And those, those transportations have to be accessible to all. So we come back to this again. I, I really want to ground ourselves in this question. Where in our UX process do we not only figure out how to make sure the products we're designing are made ethically, but even to figure out whether or not we're trying to solve the right problem? In what part of our process do we go to the product manager and the CEO and saying, we're trying to solve the wrong problem? Where do we step back and say, it's not the product that's broken, it's the whole premise? And because the majority of us are web people, my last example is about a website. And because you can't understand a website without understanding its context, let me give you some background. I'm the content strategist at a nonprofit called Green America. We do a lot of stuff, including publishing a magazine, corporate responsibility, uh, corporate responsibility campaigns, a business network. We work on huge complex issues like bringing small farmers in the Northeast US and giant international corporations together to rebuild entire supply chains to be sustainable. And I'll say a little bit more on that later because it's really cool. But if I was to summarize the organization in 10 words, this is what I'd say. And if you gave me 17 more because I'm a content strategist and I like writing, um, I'd say this. 
And stuff like this requires looking at whole social systems. And we've been doing this for 33 years, so we kind of know what we're doing, I think, for the most part. Yeah. So for this website, um, it was for one of our main focus areas, which is fair finance. And as a part of our fair finance program, uh, we produced a fossil-free investing site. And this is what we built a few months ago. And to decide what to build, I went through the normal process of gathering requirements, helping authors understand what's possible for their content, and helping guide like the overall storytelling process, which is all well and good. And like most developers, I have frameworks and stuff that I prefer. In this case, I used a SAS pattern library that I built myself um, that I've used on other projects in the organization and Jekyll to generate a static site since we didn't really need a database backing it. Other background considerations, um, I, primarily, I primarily use virtual servers but decided to stay away from AWS because um, at the time we were running a campaign against the fact that AWS didn't have a plan to migrate to 100% sustainable energy, which seriously, if, which if you go, hey, you can't use AWS, it seriously affects the sort of stack you're able to build. And these are all considerations that other people uh, here today are, are far more knowledgeable than me, so I'm going to leave it at that. This guide had absolutely fantastic content on telling people why they should move their away their money away from from fossil fuel um, investments to fossil free uh, and socially responsible investments it was fantastic for that because while other organizations in the divestment movement um, they they tend to work with larger entities such as universities to to move their, their endowments away from fossil fuels. Green America is the basically the only organization that concentrates on doing this to help individuals move their finances to socially responsible institutions. So here's where I give the disclaimer that I'm speaking here for myself and my views are not representative of Green America. But if you have investments or a retirement fund, seriously go take a look because it has a lot of great information. And the feedback that we got back the most was from financial uh, financial advisors saying that it was, it was a tool that is helping them help their clients navigate the world of socially responsible investing. In all, it's touted as a success within our organization and within the industry. But that's the problem within the industry. If we go back to this, Green America is about promoting environmental justice for everyone. But if, this, if the content for this guide was written entirely for people in the finance industry and people with enough wealth to invest, there's a problem because even though internally we think of our our fair finance work as equal access for everyone, our primary product didn't help anyone who wasn't wealthy. So <clears throat> a little background. After the financial crisis in 2008, most banks pulled out of a lot of low-income neighborhoods, in particular black neighborhoods, except it's not that they stopped needing financial institutions, they just no longer had access. And so when you and I go, yeah, I need to deposit a check, we just go to the bank because the bank is down the street. They no longer were able to go down the street. They had, if they had, were able to have a bank account, they had to go miles. So what happened was predatory lenders and check catchers moved in. Now, let's look back at what it means to be sustainable within our world. Recycling, which in many places in the US at least, is a fee on top of the trash pickup fee, which requires a check or some sort of electronic payment. 
But if you don't have a bank, that's no longer possible. In fact, any sort of online payment is no longer possible. Possible. Find that Tesla. You don't have a bank. You can't take take out a fair loan. Again, no luck. Um, marginalized communities don't need our investment advice. What they really need is information about how to find a local credit union or a local community development bank that's willing to take their business. Which means we come back to this question. Sustainability can't only be about the issues of environmental stewardship. It has to also, also be about the working conditions and miners in Bolivia, low-income neighborhoods, uh, still rebuilding after New Orleans and paying it forward so the next generation has it better than us. And sustainability must account for local and cultural differences. A brilliant design solution that helps improve access to banking services in the Mississippi Delta is not going to be the same solution that worked in Western Africa. The low energy cooling system that is built for an Oregon server farm it's not going to work for the humid climate of Hong Kong. And that means that our work as designers, which is just another word for creators of solutions to problems, is to look at the broader context and consider the socioeconomic socio and environmental factors outside of any particular set of problems we're working on. And it doesn't matter what your title is. You can be a content strategist, a designer, a CTO, a developer, or anything else. As part of the team that is designing and building the products, it is our job to match our build processes to business decisions to, to product design. And that means understanding the system we work in and the system we perpetuate. That's always been the work. We are, in part, a victim of our history. Past oppressions have deeply shaped contemporary culture, and it runs deep in our collective consciousness. And many of those wounds are still unhealed. So even though we've made amazing strides in some places, systemic oppression still, still affects many. But we can still build really neat and amazing things on top of this horrible system. The iPad is fantastic and it connects so many people in so many ways. The Tesla, I, I've, I want one because it makes easy travel better. But eventually we need to go back and fix the problems our, of our past because it holds us back. So the environmental movement in the US started as rich white people protecting things they cared about. And as recently as 1972, when it, uh, the Sierra Club polled its members on whether it should and I'm quoting here, concern itself with the conservation problems of such special groups as the urban poor and ethnic minorities. 40% of their members were strongly opposed. 40%. Only 15% said yes. The rest kind of said eh. Today, main, today mainstream Mainstream environmentalism is still tremendously white and generally pretty affluent. And even though the US is about 36% people of color, with that percentage quickly growing, less than 13% of the staff of environmental nonprofits and foundations are people of color. And remember that these are the groups that are shaping how we think about sustainability and environmental protection. Their leadership, it's about the same. So all the minor, all the minor groups still cared about sustainability, but mainstream environmentalism didn't care about them. So they ended up going off and doing their own thing. 
So those of us who work in the intersection of design and sustainability, we don't hear those voices either because the people who are talking to us about sustainability are the people in mainstream environmentalism. This isn't to say that mainstream, the mainstream environmental move, movement is intentionally shutting marginalized communities out. Because by nature, we humans are a pretty homophilious bunch. We tend to make friends and connections with people who, who are like ourselves. When we create new teams, we gather the smart people we know. And in many ways, that's a good thing because small groups of people are powerful catalysts for change. When we get together with like-minded people, we can easily have a shared vision, which honestly is one of the hardest parts of building teams. But it's really hard for homogenous teams to understand the complexities and the needs of communities outside their own experience. And that means that the needs of marginalized groups, who are often the ones who are most deeply hurt by climate change, are the ones that are ignored in our work because we build for the problems we know. Recyclable hardware, not ethical mining. Electric cars, not, access, not accessible transportation systems. Fossil-free investing, not fossil-free banking. Health trackers that completely ignore menstrual periods. The list goes on. And this isn't malicious, right? Smart people tend to know smart people. But here's the secret. Smarts is domain specific and most everyone is smart at something. And work in sustainability must care for all the intersections of systemic oppression, such as race, class, gender, ability, because they're all tied together. So I gave an example of where we found problems within our own processes at Green America. And we are going, we, we have, after finding out that our work was missing people, we are now in, in our next phase of, of fair finance content, we're making sure that we're, we're being more inclusive. So here are a few things that we look at, which I think can apply for you. One, start with your own behaviors. Like if is the majority of your, oh, is the majority of your money in a giant international conglomeration or is it in a local community institution? Find a credit union if, if you're in the US. We in tech are one of the fastest growing and richest sectors. If even just a tiny fraction of us put, us, put our money into our local communities by using the local neighborhood credit union, that expands the amount of capital for small business loans, fair mortgages, home loans within our own communities. If you still need access to the services from a major bank, which you know I do, keep some money in a major bank and use it only for travel because ATM fees are really high. But keep the majority of your savings in your local communities. Look at where you live, look at where you work, look at communities that minimize how often you need a car and support those communities. Look for mixed income housing because mixed income housing is one of the best ways to build vibrant communities that raise low income families. And then do the same for your friends. Our actions and behaviors shape the actions and behaviors for those closest to us. Do your part in shifting the collective consciousness because sometimes our job is to be the first pebble that, that makes the dam that shifts the river of progress. And then do the same for your offices. Ask HR for socially responsible retirement portfolios. If you're moving offices, help put your offices in a place that is centrally located and is accessible by public transportation. Policies that support sustainability are not just about laws, but they include laws. But they also are about policies within our own companies to consider the service, the products and services that we use. Take a really hard look at your stack. This isn't to say that we should boycott businesses that don't have sustainability plans, 
because we've actually found that boycotts rarely work. What does work are loyal customers demanding change because we want to stay loyal. And when we're looking at supply chains of, of our hardware providers, supply chains can be as transparent or opaque as the producers want. They can and will trace and audit the resources and materials involved if they have reason to. That's actually how cotton works, and they can actually trace it down to the hectare. And also, there is good news. Um, I'm not all doom and gloom. In 2010, Dodd-Frank, which instituted Wall Street reforms, required that companies who use uh, use metal materials to verify that their metals do not come out of the conflict in Congo. But the shit kind of gets smuggled out. We as users, creators, and consumers need to need to be pushing the suppliers of the products that we use and design to be better. This one's kind of big. Take a hard look at your team. Is a large portion of your team monocratic, um, monochromatic? Mostly men? Are you queer friendly? Figure out why. We're UXers. I and mean, when it comes down to it, we're UXers. If we can't even come up with a decently diverse sample size for our hiring pool, how the hell are we going to come up with one for user research? For folks in the US, form a, biz a benefit corp. In the UK, they're called community interest companies. I'm not sure about other countries. Um, but the idea is the same. Make social justice core to your business model. Give the people with the responsibility to of the responsibility of overseeing the corp the social justice component of your work, the legal authority to make sure it happens. And if you get acquired, make sure your social justice component doesn't get gutted. Find people with experience outside of your own. Interview them. Find more. This is good UX, right? If inclusion is not built into our products from the beginning, it's going to be really hard to tack it on in the future. Make space for marginalized groups at the start, because it's not an add-on feature. It has to be core functionality. If sustainability work is to succeed, we need to look at the whole system. It's not just shaping individual behavior. It's shaping the individual behavior, the behavior of our community, and the entire social system all at once. And it has to happen all at once because they're so deeply interrelated. But if you've been paying close attention, this is what we've been doing all along. Figuring out that our fossil free investing guide wasn't serving a broad enough community, that's creating user personas and testing. Designing new supply chains, that's system design. That's process design. We're doing all the time. And talking about supply chains, I said I was going to come back to this. Right now, uh, Green America is bringing together major electronic companies, regulators, and NGOs together to think about the supply chain for, for electronics. This sort of change isn't just a pipe dream. It's possible, and it's actually happening. And we're probably not the only ones doing it. We designers are the people who are literally reshaping society and the physical world to shape our vision. And that has tremendous power and a tremendous privilege. But with that tremendous privilege comes tremendous responsibility. And so, the first duty of those of us with privilege, oops, is to listen and understand the, the, the issues of those without. The second is to confront the tools that power our own privileges and shackle us to the structures to per perpetuate itself. Yes, I'm getting kind of socialist here. Not sorry. We all have privileges and we all have disadvantages. Our unique set of each 
shapes our particular worldview, our knowledge, and our ignorances. And this isn't about a ladder privilege because there's really no up and down. Rather, systemic privileges are like sets of lenses that shape how we see the world, how we see ourselves, and how the world sees us. And having one lens doesn't preclude or prevent us from having another. And this is hard, right? Privilege is as much about what we see as what we don't because we assume certain things are default. It's simultaneously a matter of how I as an individual see the world and how my upbringing has taught me to see you. So we must use all of our disadvantages to understand how our privileges make us aware of the disadvantages of others, empathize with them, and use our privileges to raise the voices of those without. As people working in design and tech, our work is impossible without entire worlds of knowledge and production to support us. It's easy to feel like everyone is doing this for us, that we are the center of this world. It's easy to assume that the world we live in is how the world works for everyone and how the world should be. After all, it's the only, the only world we know is the one we live in. But the view that our wants and needs are the same as everyone else's is an illusion. For the most part, we enjoy privileges of infrastructure that make our basic needs background consideration. And you're, if you're watching this, it's likely that you live in a world that is be, being designed and built specifically for your needs and wants. More than that, you're probably one of the ones building it. And that's the thing. We are the ones designing the things that shape the world right now. And we're doing it for ourselves because that's what we know. But the rest of the world doesn't have the same worldview as us. Do we only make apps for iPhone users? Are our websites so heavy that only the people with the fastest internet connections can afford to go to our sites? Is our language inclusive? How are we protecting our users, not just their data, but creating spaces that, that are safe for traditionally marginalized communities? In doing this stuff, there's no easy solution to it. But we humans built this program, broken system, should be able to fix it. As with most of the evil in this world, it wasn't malicious intent that created the mess of environmental injustice. It was neglect. Neglect of the environmental damage of our tools, neglect of the factories of mining workers, neglect of the black father who has to drive 30 miles to buy fresh groceries, and the Hmong mother who, who lives in a banking desert but can't use our app because there's no Vietnamese translation. Neglect of the developer who missed their child's first steps out in the living room because they were working 60 hour weeks and spending nights in the home office shipping another line of code. Neglect of the independent consultant who can't afford health insurance but not the high deductible for, for medication. And confronting this system is hard. It's really hard. It's discomforting and it's scary. It's so much easier to go back and pretend that the world that we live in the world that tells us we are amazing and everything we do is important, right, and everyone who dissents is wrong, it's, it's, important. it's so much easier for us to say that marginalized groups are failing because they need more grit, that they weren't entrepreneurial enough, that they need to lean in more, that we who are on top are here because of nothing but the labor of our own hands. But what if... What opportunity to create Facebook did the child slave in Congo have? What app was she supposed to use to report the abuse of the local general? How much of the Solomon, how much do the Solomon Islands have to lean in to keep, to keep themselves from sinking into the ocean? How much grit did the black neighborhood in New Orleans need to convince the powers that be that their levers needed to be stronger? This is why sustainability work is social justice work. And sustainability work is hard. And it can hurt. Because it means constantly banging up against the illusion that so many people in power refuse to let go. 
but we with the most privileges have the duties to our brothers and sisters without to work harder to raise them up because we're the ones with the resources to do so. Our role is not to go up their voices, but to hear them, to understand them, and to amplify them because the fruits of fruits of our work in sustainability must be for everyone, not just those who can af afford it. We must do it because it is right and just, but also because that that is the only way we produce sustainable communities. The book Cradle to Cradle wants us to think about the cherry tree. The traditional system of production ex exploits the lands and re returns nothing. It values efficiency and reducing consumption while increasing production. But the cherry tree is horribly inefficient. Every year it produces thousands of flowers to reproduce just a few sap saplings. The flowers and fruit return to the earth and nourish all the animals and ground around it. We call it beautiful. Don't get me wrong, this is nothing short of reimagining the entire social and economic system. But that's what we must do because the world is so deeply intertwined. And we must find ways to bring everyone along to create the change in the world that we all seek. Only then, when everyone's voice is heard and understood, we'll be able to create the society that sustains and nurtures all. Thanks. <laughs>